Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings of the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a poem, The Centenarian's Story. This is poem number 9 of the 43 of Drum Taps. And we're going to comment on uh, how unique this poem is in many ways to Leaves of Grass. It's one that many readers really do enjoy. Uh, just to remind, in the early poem in Leaves of Grass, The Old Cause, uh, Whitman said, my book and the war are one. I think that there's a great reason to ask war, which war? And, that, and that's going to be a huge part of, uh, I think, our study here. Now, our assumptions are that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net down the left-hand side. Everything from inscriptions on, we gave an introduction set, uh, to um, TAPS, and we just finished with City of Ships. Now, let's go to our Nortons. We're going to reference Norton several times here, and our Nortons will tell us that with very minor revision and under the same title, this poem has remained in Drum Taps Group in all editions. Its story commemorates the Battle of Long Island of August 27, 1776, which took place in the region of Washington Park, Fort Greene, when fortifications raised by rebel troops delayed enemy progress until Washington could make his retreat safely across the East River. Of course, this is a famous, a famous uh, moment in the, uh, the Revolutionary War. Uh, Whitman describes this episode briefly, by the way, in number 11 of the Brooklyn India articles, which he ran at intervals in the Brooklyn Standard from 1861 to 62. According to family tradition, one of the sons of Nehemiah Whitman, Whitman's great-grandfather, uh, lost his life fighting as a rebel lieutenant in this action. It's evident that this is one of the early composed poems of the group, for it is listed under the title, Washington's First Battle in the 1860 announcement for Whitman's never published volume, Banner at Daybreak. And we've, we've of course, commented on that one already. Now, here in a little bit, we're going to hear about the Declaration, and that's going to be the Declaration of Independence, which, adopted the preced which was adopted the preceding July 4th and was signed by members of Congress on August 2nd, only three weeks before the battle that we will be talking about. Of course, the general here will be uh, George Washington. And he no doubt read the declaration to the Kylie troops Horsack sometime and after Brown, August, the, uh, August the 2nd. Um, and he and was quartered Brown. in New York General Headquarters of his army. And General Putnam remained in immediate command at the battle scene on Brooklyn Heights. Um, and so as we get ready now for this one, we're going to see that there's three parts to this poem. First, we're going to have a volunteer, then we're going to have the vet speaking, and then finally we're going to have many consider to be Whitman. Now, I wish I could just read this in its entirety to you but and with you, but I'm going to have to, uh, you know, move uh, through it rather quickly, so we'll go right to it. The Centenarian Story, Volunteer of 1861, and then Notice to 62, and then Notice in Parenthetics, at Washington Park, Brooklyn, assisting the Centenarian. By the way, think about the importance of Washington after especially our previous poem of Virginia, the West. Give me your hand, old revolutionary. The hilltop is nigh, but a few steps. Make room, gentlemen. So right away, we've got the volunteer speaking. And give me your hand is used in one, only one time in Leaves of Grass, and it's right here. The old, the term old, we're going to come back to it, old, and uh, the old here, it's old revolutionary, later it's going to be old man, old man, old man, over and over repeated. So the, the juxtaposition of youth and old age is important for us here, okay? Give me your hand, old revolutionary. The hilltop is nigh, but a few steps. Make room, gentlemen. I think this is a key concept. In other words... Make a little bit of room in your mental space for the story you're about to hear. And then the, the juxtaposition of up versus down, very much to, uh, like the opening lines of Plato's Republic, I went down to the Piraeus, as we've lectured it at LearnStrong.net. Up the path you followed me well, spite of your hundred and extra years. You can walk, old man, though your eyes are almost done. By the way, this following me well takes us back to Dante and Virgil. I think there's a lot of the divine comedy in this poem, all right? You can walk, old man, though your eyes are almost done. The key word here is almost. Your faculty serve you, and presently I must have them serve me. Youth has to listen to old age as old age explains. Then the word rest, while I tell what the crowd around us means. So now we got this picture. We're gonna see, what are we seeing and hearing? On the plain below, notice from up to down, plain below, recruits are drilling and exercising. There's a camp. One regiment departs tomorrow. Do you hear the officers giving their orders? Do you hear the clank of the muskets? Notice how this somehow draws the reader in as now listener and viewer of what is happening. Why? 
What comes over you now, old man? And there's a bit of sententiousness here, obviously, sentimentality and all of that, but why? What comes over you now, old man? Why do you tremble and clutch my hand so convulsively? The troops are but drilling. They are yet surrounded with smiles. Around them at hand, the well-dressed friends and the women, while splendid and warm, the afternoon sun shines down, green the midsummer um, um, verdure, and fresh blows the dallying breeze or proud in peaceful cities and arm of the sea but, uh, uh, between. In other words, don't, don't, don't be upset, old man, because they're just, they're just preparing to go to They haven't yet left. This is, of course, poems one through eight of drum taps. Now we're ready to start working with poems nine and following. And there's going to be some sadness that obviously will be equated beyond the excitement. Um, by the way, with the word dallying, think of dalliance of the eagles, an earlier poem. But... Drill and parade are over. So here we go. Notice the movement. They march back to quarters. Only hear that approval of hands. Hear what a clapping. As winding the crowds now parked and dispense. But we, old man, not for nothing have I brought you hither. We must remain. It's an amazing, it's an amazing observation. You to speak in your turn. And I to listen and tell. This is what great poets always do. And of course, this is the Greek bard tradition, right? Now the centenarian will tell his story for the next movement of the poem. And I'm not going to say a lot, although there will be some referencing to other things, but just the story is quite a remarkable one. And it is taking us back, of course, to uh, an earlier battle. And it's obviously going to make us think as well of the, battle of, uh, the first battle of Bull Run of the 21st of July, 1861. The centenarian. But I clutched your hand. It was not with terror. By the way, this idea of clutching or hanging on or holding, I told you, and hugging. Of course, clutching hands also will take us to the final lines of Milton's Paradise Lost, hand in hand. But suddenly, and notice the use of that word, pouring about me here on every side and below, there, where the boys were drilling, and up the slopes they ran, and where tents are pitched, and wherever you see south and southeast and north and southwest, over hills, across lowlands, and in the skirts of woods, and along the shore, see all these prepositions, in mire, now filled over, by the way, this now filled over will take us to technology's advancement, right? Came again and suddenly raged. As 85 years are gone, no mere parade received with applause of friends, but a battle which I took part in myself. I, long ago as it is, I took part in it, walking then this hilltop, this same ground. By the way, this idea is going to echo from Song of Myself, passage 46, when he takes the student up on a knoll and he shows him uh, the, the, uh, the trajectory. I, this is the ground. My blind eyes, even as I speak, behold it, repeopled from graves. By the way, remember a Boston ballad, um, 1859, you'll remember this, uh, this game that was being played then of the, the ghosts of the revolutionaries coming. For Whitman, two important people in his, in his young life, uh, are going to be Washington and Jefferson. They are highly important. His father emphasized it to Whitman as a young boy, the importance of those two heroes. My blind eyes, even as I speak, behold it, read people from graves. The years recede. Pavements and stately houses disappear. Rude forts appear again. The old hooped guns are mounted. In other words, we're going back in time. I see the lines of raised earth stretching from river to bay. I mark the vista of waters. I mark the uplands and slopes. Here we lay encamped. It was this time in summer also. As I talk, I remember it all. By the way, I remember it all is used one time in all these of grass. It's right here. I remember the declaration. It was read here. The whole army paraded. It was read to us here by his staff, surrounded. Obviously, the general here is Washington. Stood in the middle. He held up his unsheathed sword. All kinds of referencing, obviously, to the Iliad uh, um, and the Aeneid, no question, in these, in these lines. It glittered in the sun in full sight of the army. It was a bold act then. The English warships had just arrived. We could watch down the lower bay where they lay at anchor, and the transports swarming with soldiers. By the way, this transports uh, line from Norton says, these activities occurred at nearby Staten Island, completely occupied by the British commander, General Howe, who had been steadily reinforced by the fleet for several weeks, okay? And here in a second, when we hear about Gonus's waters, we're gonna be talking about Gonus Bay immediately to the southwest uh, um, of, the, of the battleground, okay? So, let's continue. He says it this way, a few days more and they landed and then the battle. Now this the tension is building. 20,000 were brought against us, a veteran force furnished with, gold, with good artillery. 
I tell not now the whole of the battle, but one brigade, brigade early in the afternoon ordered forward to engage the Redcoats of that brigade, I tell, and how steadily it marched, and how long and well it stood confronting death. This will take us, of course, to Homer, and this will take us to the influence of Homer and, of course, of Virgil, the way in which we're not going to tell the whole Tro Troy War. We're just going to tell a few days right at the end of it in the Iliad. Who do you think that was marching steadily, sternly, confronting death? It was the brigade of the youngest men, 2,000 strong, raised in Virginia and Maryland, most of them known personally to the general, Washington, right? Jauntily, only use it all leaves of grass. Forward, they went with quick step towards Gonus's waters. Till of a sudden, notice again the this word sudden, unlooked for by defiles through the woods, gained at night, the British advancing, rounded in from the east, fiercely playing their guns. I told you about this huge, the use of the word fierce in especially drum taps. That brigade of the youngest was cut off and at the enemy's mercy. The general watched them from this hill. Again, this idea of us watching the old man telling the story of Washington watching. So you, it's, it's an amazing storytelling technique. They made repeated desperate attempts to burst their environment. They drew close together unity, right? Very compact. Their flag flying in the middle. We think of Song of the Banner at Daybreak with the flag. But oh, from the hills and how the cannon were thinning and thinning them. The horrors, obviously, of technology. And then the line of all lines. And this tells us why now we're moving from the first eight poems of drum taps into the next poems of drum taps. It sickens me yet, that slaughter. I saw the moisture gathering drops on the face of the general. I saw how he wrung his hands in anguish. Amazing eye. Meanwhile, the British maneuvered to draw us out for a pitched battle, but we dared not trust the chances of a pitched battle. We fought the fight in detachments, sallying forth. We fought at several points, but in each, the luck was against us. The idea of luck is going to be central to an understanding for Whitman of the study of the, the battles of the, of the Civil War. And, of course, there was a whole lot of terrible luck, both, both for the North and the South. Our foe advancing steadily, getting the best of it, pushed us back to the woods on this hill till we turned menacing here, and then he left us. And that was the going out of the brigade of the youngest man. 2,000 strong, few returned, nearly all remain in Brooklyn. This is powerful recognition. In other words, the, the, we lost a lot of people who are buried right here where we are. And yet now, many years later, we're going to play the game again. That idea of sending off the young men to go and fight and die. That and here, my general's, battle, my general's first battle. No women looking on, nor sunshine to bask in. It did not conclude with applause. Nobody clapped hands here then. The forgotten. And I, as I said this, this is part of Whitman's sustained theodicy. The only sin is to forget. The need to remember so much about Leaves of Grass is remembering. I think it's one of the reasons we read it. But, notice the use of the word but several times in this poem. But, in darkness, in mists, on the ground, under a chill rain, weary that night, we lay foiled and sullen while scornfully laughed many an arrogant lord off against us and camped quite within hearing, feasting, clinking wine glasses together over their victory. We've seen this before in Song of the Open Road and elsewhere, where Whitman will make that distinction between the, the people who are blessed to have everything, and then, of course, there's others who don't. So dull and damp, going back to chill rain, so dull and damp in another day, but... The night of that mist lifting, rain ceasing, silent as a ghost while they thought they were sure of him, my general retreated. And, and by the way, this retreated is Washington's strategic retreat set a new pattern of battle logistics. Norton's here, so this is Norton's. But this time he had the assistance of his enemy, General Howe. Howe's astonishing apathy was to become legendary in this first instance. He had only to send a warship or two to the East River and prevent the Americans' retreat to New York. And, and, and now what, what happens next is all going to be told as I saw, right? Okay, by the way, silent as ghost is only used one time in Leaves of Grass, and it's right here. I saw him at the riverside. We're talking, obviously, Washington. Down by the ferry, the, the, the resonances of, of Crossing Brooklyn Ferry is, is, is all over this poem. Down by the ferry, lit by torches, hastening the embarkation, my general, notice it's my general, it's my general, right, very, very personal, waited till the soldiers and wounded were all passed over, and then it was just ere sunrise, always darkest before the dawn. These eyes rested on him for the last time. Everyone else seemed filled with gloom. 
Many, no doubt, thought of capitulation, but when my general passed me as he stood in his boat and looked toward the coming sun, obviously some symbolism here, I saw something different from capitulation. In other words, a brief story told of young men who have to try to uh, defend a position that's undefendable, and many and many of them die. And then the general's response, but it isn't capitulation. It isn't giving up. It's at this moment now in the poem that we get to our third and final part of the poem with the terminus, that is to say now the end. Enough. The centenary's story ends. The two, the past and present, have interchanged. And it's almost like Whitman now steps into the poem to tell us he's the one describing this. And he says, what I'm describing is the past and the present have interchanged. That notion, that evolutionary notion, again, of transcending and including. I myself as connector, as chansonnet, uh, we saw this, of course, in France, the 18th year of these states, as chansonnet of a great future am now speaking. And I think in some ways this is what Whitman always wanted, and I think this is why he says that his book and the war are one. In other words, he says we mustn't forget the lessons of the past. We have to remember them. I'm thinking now, of course, of the great Will Durant, who said so much about the lessons of the past after his 11-volume series said. And, uh, and, and, and then he begins with these rhetorical questions. And is this the ground Washington trod? And these waters I listlessly daily cross Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Are these the waters he crossed as resolute in defeat as other generals and their proudest triumphs? I mean, you can hear the patriotism here in lines like this. I must copy the story and send it eastward and westward. Interesting, not north and south. I must preserve that look as it beamed on you, rivers of Brooklyn. And there is, to me, the key. This idea of preservation. That's what Leaves of Grass for Whitman is all about. And then, back to seeing or beholding a little bit later. See. As the annual round returns, the phantoms return. It is the 27th of August and the British have landed. We're obviously possibly talking about the first battle of Bull Run. The battle begins and goes against us. Behold, through the smoke, Washington's face. The brigade of Virginia and Maryland have marched forth to intercept the enemy. They are cut off. Murderous artillery from the hills plays upon them. Notice now the artillery is murderous, the technology has become murderous, as opposed to the earlier poems and drums tabs. Rank after rank falls while over them silently droops the flag. We're back to the flag from earlier. Baptized that day in many a young man's bloody wounds, in death, defeat, and sisters, mothers, tears. Notice the referencing of, bapti of baptism, religion, and violence coming together in, in, in the patriotism that's necessary for Whitman. The idea of tears takes us back to the rivers of Brooklyn and the water references throughout this poem. And then, of course, the word awe. Hills and slopes of Brooklyn, exclamation point. I perceive you are more valuable than your owners suppose. By the way, more valuable, as a phrase, is only used one time in all these grass. In the midst of you stands an encampment very old, stands forever the camp of that dead brigade. And I can't help but for a few moments take us back to these lines from Song of Myself, Passage 6. He says, This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men. We, we obviously have just referenced some of that in this poem. Dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. Oh, I perceive after all so many uttering tongues, and I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. I wish I could translate the hints about the dead young men and women and the hints about old men and, their, and mothers and the offspring taken soon out of their laps. What do you think has become of the young and old men? What do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it and cease the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward, nothing collapses, and to die is different from what anyone supposed, and luckier. Now how are we going to finish it to a, well I think the argument of this centenarian story poem is that democracy can never forget the sacrifices, that is to say liberty is for, for sure never free, and the importance of the hero's sacrifice must be remembered and respected. At 2B, I love this narrative approach which borrows heavily, we should point out, from Homer and Virgil. 
speaking of that, Homer and Virgil does come to mind, but I want to take us to Beowulf 3. We've given full lectures, of course, on Homer and Virgil, and as well Beowulf, uh, especially part 3. The dragon. And think about the fact that the dragon can only be conquered in Beowulf 3 by the help of the young man Wiglaf. The young must help the old, as the old, of course, will need the young. And I think this poem is definitely playing that game. Find me in 3B how to, how to own a poem like this. What do you think about America? Do you think we're forgetting our heroes? Whitman might argue we're having a tendency to forget our heroes if we so quickly, gleefully start to talk about civil war, for example. And finally, how about this one? Who is your Washington? And by that I mean, who is it in your life that you have witnessed stand up in the face of tremendous suffering, pain, oppression, and says resolutely, no capitulation? No, we're not doing it. Who is your centenarian in your life? That is to say, who's the person who tells you the stories, the great voices of the past that maybe speak to you? I'm hopeful that maybe, for some of us, it's becoming Whitman. Thank you.